Welcome to the last Ask an Atheist show of 2017, produced by the Freedom From Religion Foundation for Facebook Live. I'm Dan Barker, FFRF co-president. And I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor, co-president with Dan and also a co-founder of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. I'm Andrew Seidel, FFRF's new Director of Strategic Response and one of the nine constitutional attorneys that FFRF has on staff. The Freedom From Religion Foundation has never been larger, more successful, or more needed. And we're in a celebratory mood despite the alarming political climate on the eve of 2018 because it's our 40th anniversary year. The Freedom From Religion Foundation was formally incorporated as a national group in April 1978. And we have prepared for this last show of 2017 an overview of highlights of this outgoing year. FFRF started with just two members, Annie Lori Gaylor and her mother, Ann Nickel Gaylor, as the principal founder. And today, we've grown to well over 30,000 members. FFRF has added more than 7,000 new members in this year alone. Maybe you can guess what was the main reason for this sudden burst of new members starting a little more than a year ago on November 9th. There's got to be a better way to grow a group. Now, here's a teaser about the more than 1,000 formal complaint letters FFRF's attorneys have sent out this year, which, not incidentally, have ended more than 250 major state church violations. In this war memorial, the subject of this letter from the Freedom From Religion Foundation. In a letter to District Counsel Doug Thorne, the foundation said, quote, public school graduations must be secular to protect the freedom of conscience of all students. The FFRF wrote a letter to Neosho Mayor Charles Collinsworth asking him to remove the cross or move it to a more private location. He was shocked to receive a letter from the Freedom From Religion Foundation, but not necessarily due to the organization's threat of legal action. The Wisconsin-based Freedom From Religion Foundation took issue with Coach Hens's leading the pregame prayer. The Freedom From Religion Foundation has sent a letter to the Moss Point School District to express church and state separation concerns. The foundation says the cross is an unconstitutional endorsement of religion. Freedom From Religion Foundation attorney Patrick Elliott says his foundation also has a legal case in California right now dealing with this very issue. The Wisconsin-based group sent a letter to Longwood saying it's a government endorsement of Christianity and a blatant violation of the separation of church and state. And the Freedom From Religion Foundation sent this letter threatening a potential half-million-dollar lawsuit. The Wisconsin-based Freedom From Religion Foundation got a complaint and sent this letter down to the town asking for the trip to be canceled, telling the town government should not hold events that benefit religious organizations. We are reveling in a series of court victories, a total of nine judgments, settlements, or government actions ending violations in FFRF court cases in our favor this year. In the past two years, FFRF has won 15 rounds, settlements, or decisions. Let's quickly take a look at these legal victories. Our litigation with plaintiff Jerry Bloom removed this angel display from a public park in Shelton, Connecticut, and won FFRF the right to counter any other religious display on public land in Shelton. Here are before and after photographs of a city park in Santa Clara, California. And this one was after our lawsuit was victoriously settled in March. This is the Ten Commandments monument that has been displayed illegally for decades at the high school in New Kensington, Pennsylvania. And now it's gone. And that's our brave principal plaintiff, Marie Schaub, standing right where the two-ton monolith used to be standing. Then, in June, a federal judge ruled in our favor that this enormous 25-foot-tall Christian cross must be removed from a Pensacola park. The city, unwisely, is appealing our victory. 
We filed suit against a school district in Mercer County, West Virginia this spring, which has received a lot of national publicity, including this segment on CBS This Morning. Mercer County's Bible course is decades old and extremely popular in that community. But in the lawsuit, however, a major lobby for the separation of church and state is arguing that popular is not the same as legal. What book of the Bible is it? Deuteronomy. In church, Sherilyn Thomas has built a deep relationship with God. And as a parent, she appreciates that her daughter Tegan can continue that relationship at school. It's very important that what we teach at home could be moved on to the school and instilled there and moved to the church and instilled there so that it goes in a circle. The school portion of that circle is provided by a program called Bible in the Schools. Is it a religious course? It's the Bible. Is that a yes? I would say it is the Bible. It doesn't teach one religion. It's not a Baptist Bible. It's not a Presbyterian Bible. It's the Bible. And it is God. Created by volunteers in 1939, the program now provides more than 4,000 kids a weekly course of Bible study. How do you like class? I like it very much because I want to learn all the stuff in the Bible. We love Bible class! The voluntary program is paid for through private donations and administered by the school district. The enrollment rate among the county's 19 elementary schools is 96 percent. Do all the kids in your class go to Bible class too? Only one goes out and plays on a computer because she can't, she can't hear what the Bible says. How come? Because her dad just doesn't want her to hear all the Bible stuff. What do you think about that? I think that that's bad. She needs to go to Bible class. Comments like these are part of what attracted the Freedom From Religion Foundation, a Wisconsin-based lobby for the separation of church and state. In a lawsuit filed jointly last month with Jane Doe, a mother of a Mercer County kindergartner who wishes to remain anonymous, the group accused the county of running Bible indoctrination classes that endorse the literal truth of the Bible. If you want them to have a religious education, that burden's on you. That burden should not be on the school system. Elizabeth Deal, like Jane Doe, believes the Mercer County program violates the rights of parents who wish to keep public school a secular place. She moved her daughter Sophie out of the school system after she was bullied for opting out. They taunted her about it. They told her that she was going to hell, that I was going to hell, that her father was going to hell. How did you feel when you heard that story? It was very hurtful, of course, because she's my daughter and I don't want her to hurt. In a statement, Mercer County Schools said the Bible is worthy of study for its literary and historic qualities. The question for the courts is whether it's actually being taught that way. Hiram Sasser is a lawyer representing the school board. To completely eliminate a Bible course would be an unprecedented and drastic step. The only issue that's ever uh, arises is any kind of implementation. The public school would just have to ensure that it really did have a secular purpose. Nelson Tebby is a professor of constitutional law and religious freedom at Brooklyn Law School. But because this program and programs like it are structured just around the Bible, um, courts will be skeptical um, as to whether they really have that kind of neutral impact. For Tegan, she just hopes her class stays. How would you feel if Bible class went away? I would feel kind of angry and sad. Now, the lawyer representing the school board says it's open to changes to the curriculum if needed to keep the program going. But in this lawsuit, the Freedom From Religion Foundation is not asking for changes. It wants the program to go. And now the school board has just a few weeks to respond and effectively save or lose its program. As a result of our lawsuit, the Bible classes have been suspended. FFRF and one of our plaintiffs is appealing one aspect of the judge's ruling that our case is no longer ripe since we prevailed in ending the class. But we'd like a firmer commitment from the school that the Bible classes will not return. Beginning in September, FFRF began a run on court victories. On September 28th, a federal judge ruled in favor of FFRF and its plaintiffs that the Christian cross on the county seal and the flag of Lehigh County, Pennsylvania are an unconstitutional endorsement 
of religion. The county has voted to waste taxpayers' money and they are appealing FFRF's victory in that case. Two days later, on September 30th, a federal judge ruled in favor of our plaintiffs and the Freedom From Religion Foundation, Americans United, and the ACLU that non-theists may not be barred from giving invocations at governmental meetings in Brevard County, Florida. The county, what's new, has voted to appeal their loss. On October the 6th, FFRF won yet another court ruling in our favor. This one is historic, in which a federal judge ruled in favor of FFRF's nationally significant challenge of the preferential clergy housing allowance. The benefit permits, the IRS code calls them ministers of the gospel, to exclude from their taxable income any salary designated as a housing allowance but the benefit was refused to me and Annie Laurie because we are similarly situated heads of a non-religious organization. And this photograph also shows Annie Laurie's twin brother, Ian Gaylor, who's representing the estate of Anne Nickel Gaylor, their mother. The judge said it's unconstitutional. And she followed up in December by enjoining the Internal Revenue Service from enforcing the housing allowance. However, she then suspended her own order knowing that this decision will be appealed. We're very pleased about this important victory. On October 13, FFRF won an important ruling that Texas Governor Greg Abbott improperly removed our Winter Solstice Bill of Rights Nativity from the state capitol in 2015. Abbott, you will not be surprised to learn, is appealing this victory. Last May, we sued President Trump over his executive order saying that churches can engage in politicking. The Department of Justice admitted Trump's executive order did not have the authority to repeal the Johnson Amendment. So we consider our litigation to be successful, and we dropped it just last week. We are appealing a decision this fall that said it's perfectly all right for the Roman Catholic chaplain to prevent me as an atheist from delivering an invocation before the U.S. House. The House chaplain, at least a third of the time, lets guest chaplains deliver invocations the vast majority by Christians. Only atheists and agnostics are barred. We're asking the DC Court of Appeals to reconsider this blatantly discriminatory practice. Now let's move on to ongoing lawsuits. This is a Texas Justice of the Peace who imposes prayer on bystanders, on defendants, and on attorneys who are in his courtroom. There's been no final decision, but the judge ruled in our favor this fall that Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton, a well-known figure in the religious right, may not intervene in this case. FFRF actions have generated well over 1,500 news stories this year. Here are two national interviews of staff on Fox TV about FFRF legal complaints. Dan Barker is the co-president of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, and he joins us tonight. So you shut down a club for first graders studying the Bible. Do you feel, you feel good about that? Yes, we do. In fact, we didn't shut it down. After getting the letter that we sent, the school itself looked at the legal precedent and looked at the reasoning, and they decided to stop the illegal Bible club being led by teachers in the public schools. So there is no threat of a lawsuit here. The school did the right thing. Well, you, bully, you bullied them into it, um, bullied in, into them canceling a club for first graders. Um, but what's the constitutional problem with this? School district employees have a right to express their views. Well, Tucker, you know there's a difference between free speech 
in government speech. When those teachers are at the school, they are the government. And the children who go to that school, they look up to They're told to respect those teachers, and, and, the, and the students do. But there are families who wish to protect their children from the, the depravity and the violence that's in the Bible. And they don't think the school should be taking sides on such a personal religious issue. And in but, fact, but the, the Supreme school, Court has already addressed this issue. Andrew, I will start with you. The name of your foundation is Freedom From Religion. However, when you read the First Amendment, it talks about freedom of religion. Why would these leaders not have the ability in a country with a lot of faith-filled people to simply host a Bible study? Well, look, there, there are two major concerns here, right? There's the legality and the propriety of this. So first, these are government officials on government property using government resources on the taxpayer time getting together for a religious purpose. And that raises several issues. You know, what is the extent of the government resources being used? Are staffers pressured or coerced into attending? And you, the Freedom you from believe Religion that Foundation these has actually are submitted a number of you believe they're being coerced? No, I'm saying that I mean, this is something we don't. I'm saying that this is something we don't know, and we've actually submitted records requests to attempt to determine the extent of any possible violations. But if you leave the, the legalities aside, the propriety here, it, I mean, it can't be considered proper or in keeping with American values for government officials to get together on taxpayer time to study a book that condones slavery and the yeah. subjugation of women and the eternal torture and torment of people who don't believe like you. So well, even if it doesn't violate the Constitution directly, it certainly violates that core principle of American government, the so separation of state and Dr. church. FFRF started its important Educate Congress campaign. Our attorneys have made three forays in the past year fighting to retain the Johnson Amendment against church politicking and also fighting against Trump's proposed federal voucher plan, which will become a big issue in 2018. We'll be sending our staff back to lobby in 2018 on your behalf. In September, FFRF created a new position, the Director of Strategic Response, which is part legislative and part overseeing FFRF's informal rapid response team. We've named FFRF attorney Andrew Seidel to that new position. One of Andrew's first big projects was a definitive expose of federal court judiciary nominee, Jeff Mateer. Mateer has been in the news with his nomination recently collapsing. While other groups oppose Mateer, FFRF was the only one to document to Congress all of Mateer's conflicts of interest and his extremist views as a former employee of First Liberty, that's a radical right legal outfit. Along with that documentation, Andrew helped put together this short clip. As bad as you think it is, it's worse. We're gonna talk about the elephant in the room, and the elephant in the room is homosexuality. They speak of it as same-sex marriage, but it's so much more than that. It's really a right to engage in homosexual conduct, and their objective is to purge religion from public life. I don't see anything about right to same-sex marriage. I don't see anything saying right to homosexuality. I don't see anything about right to privacy in the 14th Amendment. Sexual liberty is, is code for homosexuality, transgenderism, bisexuality. We were looking at something on Facebook now. There's a uh, male, female, other. Why couldn't four people want to get married? Why not one man and three women or three women and one man? And I mean, it's disgusting. Well, that's not going on in, in, in our community. Oh, yes, it is. We're back to that time where debauchery rules. I mean, that's the right they're seeking. Anything goes being elevated into our Constitution. A first grader really knows what their sexual identity, I mean, it just, it's just, I mean, it just shows you how Satan's plan is working. Our motto is to protect people not only to believe, but also to be able to act on those beliefs. Seven of our legal interns are pictured here. In other actions, this is an ad Alec Loftus wrote and created for us featuring Andrew Seidel at the Ark Park that ran on Facebook. If the religious right remains unchecked, science-based education will be history. This will be the classroom of the future. 
Ken Ham's Ark Park in Northern Kentucky. Built with millions in taxpayer subsidies on land that the government basically gave to Ham. Thousands of people have already visited this park, which lets in public school children for one dollar. All to learn that dinosaurs boarded a fantasy boat along with horses and cows. The Freedom From Religion Foundation has worked to ensure that no public school will bring its students to this park, which refuses to hire LGBTQ or non-Christians. But that's just the beginning. The religious right is working to ensure that any mention of facts like evolution and climate change are kept out of our public school classrooms and textbooks. They want to funnel millions of our school children and billions of our taxpayer dollars into private Christian schools. The Freedom From Religion Foundation is fighting these dangerous abuses of power. Become a member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation today to protect science-based education and keep religion out of our public schools. Here's a Times Square digital billboard that said, the only wall we need is between church and state. Here are the top winners of the David Hudak Memorial Students of Color essay contest with over $10,500 doled out to 14 different winners. We also bestowed $10,150 to a total of 17 high school winners. These are the top six. FFRF gave $11,200 to 18 college winners. We also handed out $27,000 in Student Activist Awards to a variety of deserving students. $9,450 in prizes were awarded to 13 winners of FFRF's graduate and slightly older student essay competition which is underwritten by generous lifetime member, Professor Brian Bolton. FFRF's Ask an Atheist, of course, this show, began this past summer with now 28 shows appearing on Facebook Live in 2017. Thank you for watching. In the first week in January, FFRF will debut its new TV show, Free Thought Matters. Guests will include Steven Pinker, Katha Pollitt, Michelle Goldberg, Greta Christina, and other authors, newsmakers, and activists. Pictured here with me and Annie Laurie is guest Chris Johnson. Here is a sample of the weekly Newsbite video that FFRF produces with our new videographer and director, Bruce Johnson. If you're a member of FFRF, or if you ask for information, you will see these news bites as part of the weekly email wrap written by Amit Paul, FFRF's Director of Communications. This clip tells the major story about one of my favorite accomplishments of the year, FFRF's commissioning of a statue to complete the missing link at the home of the Scopes Monkey Trial in Dayton, Tennessee, a statue of Clarence Darrow to counter the statue of William Jennings Bryan, which was already on the courthouse lawn. In 1925, Dayton, Tennessee was a sleepy little southern town with a religious reputation. At the time, it was illegal in Tennessee to teach the theory of evolution in schools, Several city leaders decided to make Dayton the test case for this law, recruiting high school science teacher John Scopes as the defendant. The case attracted national attention. The famous lawyer, fervent Christian and former presidential candidate William Jennings Bryan volunteered to help in the prosecution, while the American Civil Liberties Union recruited populist firebrand Clarence Darrow to act in Scopes' defense. Held in the oppressively hot summer of 1925, the trial took on a circus atmosphere, and it brought Dayton the business and media attention it so craved. While the case was decided in favor of the prosecution, it was later overturned on a technicality. William Jennings Bryan died five days after the conclusion of the trial. 
1930, a group of Christian leaders established Bryan College in Dayton in his honor. And in 2005, a statue of Bryan was erected on the lawn of the Ray County Courthouse where the trial had taken place. The omission of a Clarence Darrow statue was finally remedied in 2017. The Freedom From Religion Foundation commissioned noted sculptor Zenos Fridakis to create a bronze likeness of Darrow, which was dedicated in a ceremony on July 14th. FFRF co-president Annie Laurie Gaylor addressed the assembled crowd. We are here, of course, to celebrate the unveiling of the missing link at the Ray County Courthouse. Clarence Darrow believed you can only protect your liberties in this world by protecting the other person's freedom. You can only be free if I am free. FFRF co-president Dan Barker quoted Clarence Darrow. An idea is a greater monument than a cathedral. So we have some monuments today for these two great men and it's the ideas that they stood for that keep America great. We are a proudly rebellious country. We fought a revolutionary war that kicked out the sovereign, the top-down authority telling us, here's what you must think. None of us wants to be told what to think. We want to be free to think for ourselves. The great American experiment that allows all of us, no matter what our position is, to believe, to not believe, to be political or not. Clarence Darrow, William Jennings Bryan, bravo. University of Idaho Dean Andrew Kirsten is a Darrow biographer, and he pointed out that for all their differences, Darrow and Bryan were still friends. Darrow and Bryan at various moments were in and out of touch with American politics for most of their lives. Yet neither of them ever abandoned their basic agreement that our system of governance should work for everyone, not simply those who have more than others. Actor John DeLancey portrayed Clarence Darrow for three years in a traveling stage play. He minced no words in defining the importance of the Scopes trial and the Ray County Courthouse. But in the world of the religious versus the secular, this is ground zero, the epicenter. And now that Darrow has taken up his rightful place along with Brian, the debate can be heard by all. Sculptor Zenos Fridakis had the last word before the unveiling. Oh, I hope that you like it. And I think it's, I think it's a, um, a nice companion piece. Um, and if it helps with create uh, discussion and, uh, and uh, conversation, I think that's great. While the drape hit some snags while being removed, once it came off, the assembled crowd all cheered the likeness of the great lawyer, Clarence Darrow, who will share the lawn of the Ray County Courthouse with William Jennings Bryan for decades to come. This photo of John DeLancey and me, do you see me there on the right? Unveiling the Darrow statue was taken by the Associated Press and appeared in the New York Times. You'll be pleased to know that John DeLancey will be accepting an Emperor Has No Clothes Award at the 2018 FFRF convention in San Francisco. This year, the conservative news site American Spectator called FFRF professional pains in the ass since 1978. So we decided to accept the compliment and embrace it with this staff photo beside FFRF's world's only atheist marquee. In other highlights, here Annie Laurie and I are photographed with organizer Maryam Namazi at the Secular Conference on Freedom of Conscience and Expression in London, UK. This was the largest gathering of ex-Muslim non-believers in history. Rebecca Markert, Andrew Seidel, Amit Paul, and I made various appearances at the Conference of the Religion News Association in Nashville in early September. In other media, thanks to kind donors, FFRF was able to run an ad recorded for us by Ron Reagan, and that ad ran many times on the Rachel Maddow Show on MSNBC and it also ran on CNN. 
Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist, and I'm alarmed by the intrusions of religion into our secular government. That's why I'm asking you to support the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics, working to keep state and church separate, just like our founding fathers intended. Please support the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. Our newest digital campaign plays on Ron Reagan's popular lines that you heard in that ad, where he identifies himself as an unabashed atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. You can make a free thinking statement at ffrf.org slash unabashed. You can use your digital billboard as a Facebook graphic, or you can even use it as your own banner. Every week, there's a staff pick who receives a free Unabashed Atheist t-shirt from us. Last week's staff pick was Taslima Nasrin, the famous Bangladeshi author who's been the target of a Muslim fatwa since the early 1990s. You can also create your own slogan with our Out of the Closet digital campaign, which we've been offering since 2010. But that campaign just got a facelift. We just got a good upgrade of that. If you're on our staff pick of the week, you get free one of our cute out of the closet caps. The idea behind these is not just to have fun, but to actually come out of the closet so that we don't live in a country where many people have never knowingly met an atheist or an agnostic. We are the best advertisement for free thought, so go to ffrf.org slash out to add your face, your voice, and your sentiments to the out of the closet movement. We also like to acquaint you with FFRF's distinguished honorary directors. Harvard's illustrious Steven Pinker, whose new book, Enlightenment Now will be out soon, serves as honorary president of FFRF. Other honorary directors are Jerry Coyne, Richard Dawkins, Daniel C. Dennett, Ernie Harburg, who's the son of the famous lyricist Yip Harburg, Jennifer Michael Hecht, Susan Jacoby, Lawrence Krauss, Robin Morgan, Mike Newdow, Katha Pollitt, Ron Reagan, Robert Sapolsky, the artist Edward Sorrell, and the comedian Julia Sweeney. Speaking of Julia Sweeney and Steven Pinker and Katha Pollitt, they were speakers at FFRF's 40th annual convention this last fall, along with Michelle Goldberg, the new columnist for the New York Times. And also at the convention, the comedian Paula Poundstone, among other speakers. Next year's convention will be at the Hyatt Regency on the Embarcadero in San Francisco, the weekend of November 2 through 4. We and our chapters and activist members have been busy during this season of the war, not the war on Christmas, but the war on the separation of church and state to be sure that free thinkers are represented at government forums that feature religion. Our displays are currently up in several state capitals and in a variety of public parks. So what a year this has been. Yes, quite a year. And we actually have a couple questions that I think we should take now. Uh, so Michelle Kay asks, congrats on so many victories in 2017. What are the next steps for FFRF and what are your priorities for 2018? That's a very good question. Um, I would say um, more educating Congress. There's going to be more mm -hmm. lobbying because vouchers are going to be the big push. Um, Betsy DeVos, as a Secretary of Education, has already said, it's my turn. I've been waiting patiently, and now <laughs> we want to defund public schools and fund religious schools. So obviously we'll be lobbying about that. We'll be asking our members, of course, to chime in with our action alerts 
Um, what do you see? I think the Johnson Amendment fight is going to continue yeah. into 2018. I don't think we've seen the end of that. And I also think there's going to be a lot more winning for FFRF. Uh, we're still not tired of it yet. So I, that, those are my two guesses. What about you, Dan? Well, what about uh, ju uh, judicial nominations? Is that going to be another big thing? Well, uh, it is ongoing. We're going to see a lot more of that, yes. We're seeing the court stacked, and of course the big speculation is about Justice Kennedy mm -hmm. and how long he's going to hang in. And that will be a, a big blow if, if Trump is allowed to replace a, a swing vote. That, that will be the something we vote. will definitely be taking action on. But hard to stop. So when it comes to these nominations, doesn't it seem like Trump has been weakened somewhat so that there's less likelihood of these nut cases getting appointed to the bench? Well, in the, yeah, the last three nominees, there have been three that have recently pulled uh -huh. out uh, because they were so unqualified, including Mateer, who FFRF worked extensively to stop. As we showed in the year in review. And I think that is raising the awareness in Congress that these nominees are just not qualified to sit on the federal bench for a lifetime appointment. Um, so hopefully we will see that slow down and maybe weed out some of these, these really terrible candidates. So the Constitution says there shall be no religious test for public office, but maybe there ought to be some kind of a test, some kind of a basic minimal, you know. <laughs> a basic legal knowledge test would be acceptable, I think. Yeah. Huh. Or perhaps uh, Loyalty to one's government. <laughs> or, <laughs> or knowledge of the subject that you're overseeing. Yeah. Huh. We, have, and we actually have this question is tied uh, to that one. Greg Happ asks, do you have any prognostications or predictions for the new year? Oh, wait a minute. I used to have the gift of prophecy, <laughs> but I think it's totally worn off. I do predict that a, a prominent male leader is going to be accused of some past sexual abuse. I predict that will happen. At least one will happen. <laughs> At least one. I think you're safe there. Maybe See? one a week, you mean? <laughs> so when it happens, you can say I was right. Um, well, I think you already hit the, the big one for me. I think vouchers is going to be just a huge fight it's in the coming year. It's going to be year. painful. Yeah. Uh, and it will be also at the state level, not just at the federal, although Trump is the first president to propose a federal voucher program, mm -hmm. and that they have put that on hold, and that will be the big push. Uh, I guess another prognostication I would make is that basically we should look at any promise that Trump made to the religious right that he has not fulfilled yet because he has been very busy um, giving them these gifts when people have said he hasn't passed any legislation um, except perhaps the, the, the tax package. They're wrong in terms of what he has been able to accomplish for the religious right through executive orders or cabinet appointments. Um, he's making it happen. The payback is happening. And uh, I didn't check that list, but I think we should all go back and look at those lists that he promised to the religious right, and then we'll know what what's, we're going to be doing in 2018. I think that that's a great point. Heather McDonald asks if we're going to be doing anything about the banned words at the CDC. And you already did something. Yeah, so Heather, you go check our website, uh, look at the news release, and we wrote a letter on that, and you can see what FFRF has done. And, and to explain that, that's where they said that in their, um, I think it was their policy uh, statements, they weren't to use a number of words, but including, of most concern to FFRF, science-based and evidence-based. And of course, they've been trying to do damage control and say, no, those words aren't banned. But clearly, um, the concepts were to be swept away. Orwellian. Yes. Well, maybe they should ban faith-based exactly. from our policy statements. <laughs> At least certainly from our government. Uh, Amy Allen asks, what do you think was the most important victory of 2017? So I guess we'll ask that. What do you think personally was, was FFRF's best victory? Well, I think that Dan and I are going to be um, loyal to the lawsuit that, that we're the most involved in, which is the housing allowance lawsuit. It's been a long battle. This is our second lawsuit with a uh, challenge with Dan and myself um, as, as co-plaintiffs. And yet again, in December, we won a historic order in federal court by Judge Barbara Crabb um, telling the Internal Revenue Service that they cannot enforce the housing allowance that uniquely privileges clergy. Of course, then she immediately put it on hold <laughs> because she knows it's going to be appealed. But um, there was the religious right has been saying all along with our first victory that was um, turned back because of standing. Now with this victory, they're saying, oh, this only ap applies to clergy who live in the federal district in Wisconsin mm -hmm. where this case was taken, or it doesn't apply nationwide. Barbara Crabb made that very clear. It's unconstitutional. It's privileging religion. 
Dan and I are equally situated with clergy, we should be allowed to claim the same tax privilege. And I think what's important, I think why we would pick this as a significant case, all the cases are important, removing a Ten Commandments monument or a cross from city property, uh, which are victories in a local area, but this is the whole country. This is every single minister, priest, rabbi. Denomination. Anyone who gets pays taxes to the IRS. This is, this is a massive, it affects at least a, a 50,000 clergy in the country. Well, and I think in terms of the financial impact, this is probably one of the biggest lawsuits in state church separation history, it's, not just for um, FFRF. No, I've forgotten, 80 million a year at least in perks, I mean in unpaid taxes by clergy, meaning usually that the rest of us end up getting taxed more to make up for it. Mm -hmm. And this is where they can deduct from their um, taxable income uh, anything they're paid as a housing allowance, and it can include all kinds of perks. You know, it can include a swimming pool. Yeah. Um, it can include the, um, some of their bank fees. Even it's not just um, it's not supposed to be more than the um, what they could rent their uh, home for. Well, and but they have been double dipping as well because they can also exclude the interest on their mortgage using tax-free dollars to start with. So it's like a double dipping that's happening here. So, so it's, I mean, it's, it's a great lawsuit. This question is hard because it's kind of like pick among your favorite children. Well, but just to add the prognostication, of course, is this is going to be bitterly it will, fought. It's it going be appealed, to be appealed yeah. to the Seventh Circuit. And then, as in last uh, round, every church denomination, including those Unitarians, mm -hmm. are going to come speaking up, um, saying we don't want to give up our tax perk for ministers of the gospel. And it's because it's such a huge financial stake. But the, really what they're saying is we don't want to help non-believers or secular groups. We don't want them to have a break. We just want to get it for ourselves. Mm -hmm. You would think that conservatives would like our victory because Here's a way to increase revenue without raising taxes. It's just closing a, a, a loophole. It's closing a bad loophole. And, and you would think they would say, great, loophole. here's a great way to bring some more revenue into the treasury. Yeah. Well, Andrew, what do you think was the greatest well, I mean, victory? like I was trying to say, this is like choosing among your children. Right. It's very difficult. Um, but for me, I think stopping Jeff Mateer was very personally satisfying. satisfying. Uh, you know, we put a lot of effort into that. It was one of the first big projects the strategic response team took on. And, I mean, he is sort of, he worked for the anti-FFRF, you know, the, this, the first Liberty Institute. So getting somebody like that off or preventing somebody like that from entering a lifetime appointment on the federal bench was very rewarding. I think that would have to be my favorite. And I think that every attorney in the office would probably have a different uh, sure. answer, the, the case that they, they felt... Um, um, the most engaged in because they were co-counsel. Well, Ch Chino Valley, I mean, what a huge victory. is now, now it's before the Ninth Circuit as we speak uh, yeah, and on I, appeal. I, th I think we'll win that one on appeal, too. I, I'll, pr I'll predict that. I'll predict okay. in 2018 we will absolutely win yeah. that case. I'll even go, I'll go so far as to say it'll be a 3-0 win at the panel. That's okay, now we should say for the listener, what is, what is Chino Valley so this about? Is a, this is a challenge against a school board that has prayer, Bible reading, and proselytizing at every one of their meetings. We won at the district court level. The school board appealed it to the Ninth Circuit, and we've already had oral arguments, so a decision is pending probably in the next six months or so. And then I think I would have to say, non-legally, my favorite accomplishment of the year was getting the Clarence Darrow statue safely ensconced on the lawn of the Dayton, um, Tennessee uh, courthouse, the, the Ray County, Ray County. courthouse, um, where that was a real a big fight and it was kind of scary. There were death threats. Um, the uh, sculptor was getting a little scared to go down there, but it all ended very well. And we were able to balance something um, historically that will really live on in history, that people who go to p a pilgrimage to the Ray County Courthouse, as people do, home of the Scopes trial of 1925, will not just see a statue commemorating a creationist, <laughs> but they will see a statue commemorating Attorney for the Defense, Clarence Darrow. Well, your great line in there when you when you introduced it was that we now have restored the missing link <laughs> at the at courthouse this, at the uh, Scopes Trial Courthouse. So. That's great. So we have one more question, uh, which is how many members does FFRF have, and what would you like to, the membership to be to grow to by next year? Asks Chelsea Jacobson. Well, the membership, uh, the growth has been really really steep in this last 12 months since the election. 
we picked up uh, almost 8,000 members. We were about 23,000. And today, as we speak, we're, cl we're close to 31,000. But you know, it does this. It's kind of like the stock market. So it might go down to 30,000. It might go up. But we're way over 30,000 members now. So I would like to say that last year, um, certainly on Free Thought Radio, um, we didn't have Ask an Atheist. I said that the goal was to be 30,000 by the end of the year. I was hoping by June, and we were close. So you're a prophet. <laughs> so, well, my prognostication now is um, let's aim for 35 and try for 40. Uh, let's aim for 40 and, and try to make sure we have 35. And, of course, the Freedom From Religion Foundation ought to have 50,000 members, with nuns being, N-O-N-E-S, being the fastest growing segment of the population. Uh, there's no reason why we shouldn't be rivaling groups like the ACLU. And, and I think it's important for everybody watching to join as well, you know, and it's not just that we want people's membership fees, we certainly put it to good use, but, you know, when, when we're lobbying Congress, being able to say that we represent 22,000, 25, 30,000, if we could say we represent 50,000 people, that makes us much more influential and makes our ability to create change a lot stronger. You, you've said it, and I've had some f people calling from the Ron Reagan ad where it says support the Freedom From Religion Foundation, and they say, what do you mean by that? Do you want money? And I said, well, we'd like you to join. We would, yes, there's a $40 membership fee, but it's your voice that counts, making us a larger group. We really have much more power the larger we are. Yeah. And free thinkers have historically had so little uh, political power, media power, and it's time for us to flex our muscle, muscles uh, collectively and also, I think we failed to talk about the midterm elections. And if you're a free thinker, you need to vote. And I think most of the members of the Freedom From Religion Foundation are registered voters, 97 percent. That's phenomenal. But I think it's really the youthful free thinkers out there um, that maybe didn't register. There are barriers in their way and students. But we are a powerful bloc. We can change the outcome of the 2018 midterm elections. And think about what churches demand of their members. A weekly tithe, 10 percent of your income. In some churches, it's 10 percent of the gross. And joining the Freedom From Religion Foundation at $40 a year is a real bargain. It's a way to make a real difference, not just sitting in pews and praising a ghost in the sky, but to make a real difference, as you've heard with the tremendous victories we've had over this past year. You can be a part of that. And I should also add that um, student membership is only $25 a year, but as soon as we get the technical kinks fixed, uh, we are going to be offering students up to the age of 25 entirely free student memberships um, with a digital subscription to our newspaper, Free Thought Today, which is going to be going um, mobile friendly in 2018, and that's another nice announcement that hasn't been possible. So you'll be able to get it on any of your um, your iPads or your iPhone. smartphone and read the newspaper much more effectively, share it. So um, that's going to be a nice bonus. So don't forget to get out there and vote, and please join your voice to ours by joining the Freedom From Religion Foundation. And until then, we are eternally your watchers on the wall. At this season of the winter solstice, may reason prevail. The staff of the Freedom From Religion Foundation sends you heathen's greetings.